This is a crusade. This is a holy war against the deep state. Where are the dictators? Where are the strong men? Donald Trump is our instrument for retribution. I'm going to fight for Christians. I'm going to fight for white people. They have the great reset. We have the great awakening. And why shouldn't I root for Russia? Because Which I am. I want to see these people go through misery because of their grooming against our children. After the assailant entered the home asking, where's Nancy? Where's Nancy? Those are the very same words used by the mob when they stormed the United States Capitol. I did nothing wrong. Welcome to the Did Nothing Wrong podcast, where we cut through the noise and help you make sense of the chaotic information space around us. I'm Griff Somke. On this episode of the Did Nothing Wrong podcast, Robert Downen from the Texas Tribune joins me once again to discuss the massive rightward political shift in Texas over the last few years, the coddling of white nationalists, the secessionist movement, and the billionaires who finance it all. Stick around. Robert, welcome back to Did Nothing Wrong. It's great to have you here again. Thank you for having me back. Yeah. So it's been a crazy few months in Texas. Last time we talked, the impeachment of state attorney general Ken Paxton was in progress. And it seems that he managed to survive it. And not only that, he seems to have been able to make good on his threats of retaliation for those who supported it. What happened? Yeah, I mean, so, you know, last time we spoke, it was about uh, the ways that these far right billionaires who are Ken Paxton's biggest backers, and we will be getting into them, I'm sure today, Oh yeah. but kind of talked about the myriad ways in which they were trying to influence the process. And, you know, I won't say that they were solely responsible for it, but Paxton obviously survived that. And mm -hmm. almost immediately, or, you know, as the votes were still being cast, the uh, far right faction of the Texas GOP started vowing scorched earth campaigns against anyone who supported it. And there was some hiccups along the way, but uh, as we'll get into that, they delivered. Yeah, they definitely did. And it seems that they got a lot of help from a guy named Tim Dunn. And this is not a name that a lot of people outside of Texas have necessarily heard of, but he wields a tremendous amount of power within the state and it reverberates all the way out to a national level. And he's one of you know Paxton's biggest backers. Candidates he backed in the recent Texas primary won 11 of 28 races outright, and there's another eight headed to a runoff. So who is this guy? Where did he come from? And what are his long-term goals for Texas and for the United States as a whole? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, there's Tim Dunn and then there's also Ferris Wilkes who we'll kind of get into as well. But Tim Dunn is this West Texas oil man, made his money in um, the fracking business. Mm -hmm. And he has really over the past 15-ish years or so, slowly emerged as one of, if not the most important political donors in the state. Um, I would argue that he probably is now. But even 10 years ago, you know, he was funding these groups that were, their, their strategic goals were to constantly be attacking other people in the Texas legislature as insufficiently conservative as rhinos. Right. And they've always been, you know, less concerned with any concrete policy objectives than they have been just perpetually moving the party rightward. And they've built Tim Dunn and Ferris Wilkes, and to a lesser degree, Ferris Wilkes' his brother, Dan, who's kind of taken a backseat from politics in the last few years. But they really built this sprawling network of political action committees, dark money groups, nonprofits, media websites. And Ferris Wilkes and Dan Wilkes were key support to uh, Ted Cruz's first campaign. They were seed investors in the Daily Wire. Um, mm. And then Dunn was always running this group called Empower Texans uh, with a handful of other rich billionaires. And then around probably 2017, 2018, within the state's political donor class, there was kind of started, you started to see a little bit of fracture and a falling out in part because of the more business oriented side of those groups were kind of worried about the effects of some of the social policies, including like, you know, bathroom bills. Right, right. And so there was kind of this, this falling out, uh, well, I don't, not falling out as much as it's really where the rivalry started to kind of come into clear focus. And so since then, Tim Dunn has really been um, the driving force behind Texas is far right, pouring tens of millions of dollars that just that we know about in probably more that we don't into all of these different candidates and lawmakers who basically just exist to threaten other or threaten incumbents with primary challenges. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times and uh, until recently, these primary challengers weren't even like viable candidates, you know, that they, they would hobble into the GOP primary and, and you know, maybe get 40 percent of the votes you know, despite having $300,000 from West Texas oil tycoons. Right. But what they did is that they 
kept the incumbents in line. You know, they kept they kept a, 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 any any incumbent will tell you like I I am you know they're not concerned about a democratic primary they are a, a opponent they're not concerned about being attacked from their left and again these are very like sterling conservatives we're talking about like these yeah. are not rhinos and what they've re- what tim dunn's network has really successfully done is just slowly pulled the states really and the state gop in particular towards their brand of like hardline immigration hardline anti lgbtq uh, views towards school voucher programs you know tim dunn is a handful of times he's commented on it he has kind of denied being a christian nationalist but all signs point to that right he has this choice quote from i think 2004 where he talks about how his favorite part of the apocalypse will be when uh jesus kills all unbelievers with with uh, words streaming out of his mouth like a sword so this is the kind of guy we're talking about <laughs> whoa and yeah and we're early backers of ken paxton and really have been the driving force behind the rightward lurch both in Texas and to a lesser but growing degree nationally. Wow, right. It sounds funny to hear that kind of quote out of the guy's mouth, but the guy is a billionaire and he spent all of this money influencing politics in this massive state. And as a result, he's been able to get a lot of the candidates that would ordinarily, you know, oppose a guy like a Ken Paxton who's just been incredibly corrupt. But he was able to keep a lot of these same people in line with the threats of we're going to primary you. We're going to put somebody out there who's going to, you know, beat you in this. And you mentioned the Wilkes brothers. Are they a similar story? Yeah, both. Also, you know, I think they grew up at less like goat farmers. I don't know. They have a very real rags to riches story and made that also made their money in fracking. Um, and they were kind of, I think initially there was, when they first started getting really involved, they were behind more of like the, they were more in like the, you know, I guess comparatively more moderate, but, you know, over the last 10 years, as Dan Wilkes has kind of peeled away a little bit, Ferris Wilkes has become basically Tim Dunn's, you know, partner in this broader cultural and political project. All right. So one of the political groups that has been heavily funded by these guys is called Texans United for a Conservative Majority. But up until recently, it was called Defend Texas Liberty. And their former chairman is a guy named Jonathan Strickland. And the reason he's the former chairman seems to be because of his public association with a guy named Nick Fuentes, who we have covered extensively on this program. Strickland's political consulting company is called Pale Horse Strategies, and they hosted Fuentes for an entire day recently. This caused a massive outrage with nearly half the Texas GOP's executive committee demanding that the party cut ties with these guys. But it seems like the group wrote it out, changed the name. Now they're back in business. So how do they always manage to come back from this kind of stuff? And why does the outrage never really seem to stick? Yeah, I mean, you know, before there was Defend Texas Liberty, there was, again, as I said, Empower Texans, which had to rebrand because their leader secretly recorded the house speaker and then released audio tapes which really uh, upset a lot of uh, you know even you know house republicans and then not long after two of their uh, top guys were accidentally recorded uh, or released wow. <laughs> accidentally recorded a podcast in which they were mocking greg abbott's use of a wheelchair so Ooh. they spun that off and then defend texas liberty came in and that was run by this guy named Jonathan Stickland, who is a uh, former state rep. And I, I wrote this whole thing about him in January. But basically, he's this guy who, you know, in 2008-ish, he was working in pest control in the Dallas area. Huh. And, you know, he was a shit poster. Like, I, I can yeah. say that here. I had to put that in print. They wouldn't let me. But um, he was a troll and a shit poster. And he kind of, you know, I wrote this story probably two months ago, going through all of his old forum posts that I found and seeing how he like stumbled into this Ron Paul forum and then Ooh. slowly just became more and more disenfranchised with the political system until by a stroke of luck, basically, he was at the right meeting in like 2010. And one of Tim Dunn's like top guy or top um, activists saw him and said, Hey, you should run for the state legislature. And then through his eight years in the legislature, you know, he passed one bill. His job really was to gum up the system and just really be a nuisance. And by the time that, you know, Empower Texans had spun off and Stickland was leaving the legislature, like he was a grassroots hero, you know, a hero amongst this grassroots that like really since the Tea Party era had, or even before that, I guess, but really in the in the Tea Party era had fully bought into this idea that like anything that is obstructing the government process is inherently 
okay. Right. So he took over, um, you know, this new group, Defend Texas Liberty, I think in 2021. And really, you know, when we last spoke, a lot of who I was actually talking about, about running interference for Ken Paxton was Stickland and Defend Texas Liberty. They gave $3 million to Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick, not long before Patrick presided over the Paxton impeachment trial, which caused a lot of questions about his uh, impartiality. Right. Um, and then Patrick ended the, uh, once the impeachment votes were done, he basically gave like a 10 minute speech, just excoriating the process. And, you know, uh, some people said um, kind of raising even more questions about, you know, his impartiality. He's obviously denied all that, but so all of that happened in late September. That was September, I think, 18th. And then on October 1st, I received a tip from a source within that world that Nick Fuentes was going to be at their office at the Pale Horse offices. And Pale Horse is a consulting firm that Stickland owns that does, you know, it is basically kind of the beating heart of this of this political network. Right. And so I basically we I me and a photographer drove, you know, at 2 a.m. or whatever to to Fort Worth and staked out this meeting and got these photos of Fuentes walking out. And I think those photos really crystallized, you know, a decade plus of warnings from more moderate Republicans that Tim Dunn's kind of no enemies to our right approach to politics would invariably open the door for extremists. Mm -hmm. And so it really was this lightning rod and really made defend Texas Liberty, at least for a little bit toxic, right as they were planning to gear up for their retribution against Paxton and use that as an excuse to further try to cleanse the party of any moderate, more moderate voices. And again, I say more moderate. I want to be clear that these are still very Right. By, by almost every measure, dark red Republicans. But in any other state, these people yes, would yes. be very, very dark red. I live in Washington state and they're probably more dark red than anything we have in the legislature up here. Most of them. Yeah. And I mean, and again, like that is part of the I don't want to say genius of Tim Dunn's political approach, but like with endless money and he has a long term uh, view of politics, um, I would argue potentially eschatological. And so, you know. As long as that needle is slowly moving towards his brand of hardline views, then it is a success for him. And so DTL, Defend Texas Liberty, really was big proponents of this idea that like the Texas legislature is secretly under control of Democrats. Right. I remember hearing that and thinking, yes, wow, this is just. Well, and again, but it, but it resonates, you know, there mm -hmm. there are they have successfully built a political network with its own media ecosystem and, you know, really kind of core sets of beliefs about what Texas is, was, and should be. And that thing resonates with their, with their voters, as I'm sure we'll get into But anyways, so um, in the wake of the Defend Texas Liberty and Fuentes scandal, there was some, uh, you know, debates amongst the party pretty significant about whether, you know, they should, the Texas GOP should cut ties with DTL. That was also compounded by, you know, we did a lot more reporting after the Fuentes scandal and found a number of open anti-Semites and white supremacists who were working in that orbit, Right. some of whom were at the meeting with Fuentes. And so that kind of made DTL toxic. And so Dunn and Wilkes did what they just often seem to do, which is just spin off a new entity and put their heads down and pretend nothing happened. That's how Texans United for a Conservative Majority came about. And it ended up being a you know massive player in the uh, primary elections this uh, earlier this month. Right. And just to kind of illustrate how they were able to sort of dodge this, they were working on passing a ban on associating with Nazi sympathizers and Holocaust deniers, and it couldn't get done. They had to water this down significantly because they said that this was a slippery slope and these things are often just a matter of opinion, which is kind of, yeah. And there's a bit from your reporting on this that I want to read because it sums up just how utterly shameless this got. This is from your story entitled Texas GOP executive committee rejects proposed ban on associating with Nazi sympathizers and Holocaust deniers this is from December 2nd, 2023. Other committee members questioned how their colleagues could find words like anti-Semitism too vague despite frequently lobbying it and other terms at their political opponents. I just don't understand how people who re routinely refer to others as leftists, liberals, communists, socialists, and rhinos 
don't have the discernment to define what a Nazi is, committee member Morgan Sicinius Graham told the Tribune after the vote. It's almost like the old quote from Upton Sinclair, it is difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on his not understanding it. And it seems like this entire apparatus depends on none of these people understanding it, at least in public. So is that accurate? Yeah, and I mean, I also think you know what the a, a compounding part of this too is that that Fuentes meeting was on October sixth. Now, obviously, everyone is familiar what happened on October seventh. Ah, right. And the next day, we published this story, and it was also we published the story a day before the the Abbott had called lawmakers back for a special session on school choice programs, which are a very contentious issue in Texas specifically, and not a Democrat versus Republican. It is rural Republican versus urban Republican in many ways. Right, and so. You know, I think that some of the response from the Texas GOP was like animated by the fact that this was happening right in the wake of Hamas's attack. Right, right. And so there was a certain, a, a large portion of the Texas GOP that was adamantly opposing anti-Semitism and also making the case that like, it is especially important for us to be vocal about this at this moment. And going into that meeting, the executive committee meeting where they discussed the ban, there were uh, roughly about half of the executive, the yeah, Texas GOP's executive committee had signed on for for this ban. And it really just like I watched over this two, this two day process as this resolution went from like, we are explicitly condemning Defend Texas Liberty and Nick Fuentes and calling for a break to like just slowly get watered down and watered down to the point where it was just like, OK, well, we will not associate with Nazi sympathizers, Holocaust deniers and anti-Semites. And that was still not palatable to a little more than half of the executive committee. I should also note a, a big part of this, the te Texas GOP is chaired by a guy named Matt Rinaldi, who um, was Stickland's ally in the legislature. His uh, legislative career was also bankrolled by Don and Wilkes. And he uh, was also, we, we took photos of him walking out, you know, at, outside of the building while Fuentes was in there. Right. And he denied meeting with Fuentes. He said he didn't know that he was there. But then spent the next, you know, really few months just viciously attacking anybody who defend or who attacked Defend Texas Liberty. Come to find out that uh, the entire time that he was doing that, we found in SEC records that he was working as an attorney for Ferris Wilkes. So <laughs> that is all to say that there was there was a lot of different things that kind of were colliding at once with this vote on the anti-Semitism. It didn't go through. Um, that caused a huge uproar, like national media attention. And then they passed a very, 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 very watered down version of it. I think last month or two months ago, they basically just said, we will not associate with anti-Semites, which literally right before I got on this call, I was uh, talking to a Republican activist about a woman who is on Twitter talking about shekels and <laughs> she's a precinct chair and i was like this 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 would be an interesting test case and i i i'm going to assume that it probably goes nowhere so yeah you kind of have to figure it's enough of a fig leaf that they can say look we did something but you know if anybody useful actually says something they'll figure out a way to say it's not really what we're hearing sure and and again going you know not not to make it all about october 7th but one of the things that I think politically was important for them is that if, if we are taking a public stance against anti-Semitism in response to the fact that we have anti-Semites in our ranks, we are losing the moral upper hand to constantly be condemning Democrats, you know, and painting them as anti-Semites because of their critiques of Zionism or the, the Israeli government. And right. so the, you know, saw that we saw that that when the when the ban failed there was this big discussion you know a lot of people just going up saying well anti-semitism isn't a problem on the right like it's the left that has the problem so. uh, <laughs> yeah did, did nick fuentes tell you to say that just out of curiosity <laughs> <laughs> no seriously and you know this isn't even the only instance of these groups having ties to fuentes and other anti-semites and white nationalists um there's another group that you wrote about funded by dunn and the wilkes brothers called texans for strong borders their founder and president is a guy named chris russo and he has operated in fuentes racist movement on various social media platforms under the username optics respecter it also appears that he was fuentes chauffeur for the meeting at pale horse as well because you guys got some photos of this guy coming out of that meeting and hanging out with nick fuentes so he's not even the only one in this organization with ties to Fuentes. Why is this not career suicide for these people? 
You know, that's a good question. Russo is also very, very maybe best friends with uh, one of the key operatives in that orbit. And I, I should pause to give a huge shout out to Amanda Moore because she was the one who broke that story first up on Russo. Oh, absolutely. We had been poking around on it and uh, she is the the unfortunate groiper expert, so was able to piece it <laughs> quickly. Thank you, Amanda. We love you. We appreciate all you do. Yes. So Russo actually was, uh, up until about a year and a half ago, two years ago, he was working as a flight controller at NASA in Houston. Like, it, it is still a fascinating story to me. He, is, he has this great job. He's got a you know, family, kids, good group of friends, like, and he just ups and leaves that job to go work at Texans for, to lead this new group called Texans for Strong Borders, which is, is linked directly to Defend Texas Liberty, Dunn and Wilkes. And basically, Texans for Strong Borders has, for the last probably two years, really been not the driving force. But a key driving force in, you know, again, just attacking, attacking lawmakers from the right on the border. You know, they want to end birthright citizenship. They were big proponents of SB4, this uh, bill that was just, you know, that is in front of the, text, or the U.S. Supreme Court right now that basically deputizes all law enforcement to arrest people on suspicion of being here illegally. Right. Like they've, they were big proponents of all of these immigration policies that even a few years ago would have probably been seen as too hardline for the Texas GOP. And, you know, going back to the Dunn and Wilk strategy of, you know, just incrementally moving thing, the Overton window to the right. One of the things that I think is underlooked is if you go back even a few years and look at how Greg Abbott talked about the border, like he was by no means like a, obviously was a, a border hawk and very hardline on it. But compare it to now. He has taken a much more hardline approach to immigration issues. And part of the reason for that is because in 2022, he faced a primary challenger from someone who was funded to the tune of like, I think, four million dollars from Dunn and Wilkes, who only just attacked him on the border. If you're Greg Abbott, you are not worried about losing support from your left. You're concerned about losing it to your right. And that has really, you know helped, I think, push him towards policies that maybe even a few years ago he was at least publicly not espousing. So Right. Because there's no way they would have tried something like that state bill for a few years ago, I don't think. The idea that all of a sudden every law enforcement officer in the state of Texas is now deputized to arrest anybody they think is in the country illegally, this just seems real overreaching and just generally bad. Yeah. It's not the kind of thing they'd have even tried to push. I mean, an, another good example is just uh, both the literal term and the the legal framework around the the idea that we're under invasion. You know, oh, after yes. the El Paso, after the El Paso Walmart shooting, again, this guy drove from the Dallas area to target Hispanic people because he believed in great replacement theory. You know, there was a bunch of outcry against Abbott because they were basically because you know he was using this term in you know describing immigrants as invaders, and he briefly said like agree like okay I'll stop using that because I understand the danger of it. Um, at the same time that was happening, there was this coalition of like border county officials, some of whom have some affiliation to Proud Boys and the Texas secessionist movement, who were kind of starting, I think, in around like 2017, really pushing the idea that like, no, we should just declare that we are, are under invasion. And like, they think that they like viewed it as like this kind of constitutional cheat code that allowed them to just supersede the feds. Right. And Abbott resisted for years calls from his right to declare an invasion. And then, you know, we saw what happened in Eagle Pass earlier this year. Like, like that was kind of the culmination really of this ideology or this legal theory that started really, I would say, pretty on the fringes. And just over the last four or five years has, has become not just mainstream, but is the key talking point by Abbott and a coalition of what 20, whatever it was, 29 other Republican governors who rallied behind him in his standoff with the Biden administration. So right. we are really seeing the fruits of this idea of this long term strategy to just incrementally normalize things. Yeah. And that's what we're seeing. Like you said, it's, it's like they take a really, really fringe idea, something that on the surface has zero merit. And, you know, the Constitution basically says you can't do that. This is not a power that the states have. but they push and they push and they push and they get to the point where it turns into this kind of standoff and you get support from other states and things right now are so polarized that you're just, you're a state governor, a Republican, you're almost having to go ahead and do this because of where that's at. There's a lot of these done types around in various states that will also bankroll. They've seen how well it worked down in Texas and they'll bankroll the same sort of challengers 
to right-wing elected officials if they're not being sufficiently right-wing. Yeah, there are a lot of Dunn and Wilkes types. I think that Dunn and Wilkes have really created a model within the state legislatures. And again, we are even seeing in Colorado, probably two months ago, there was a leaked slideshow from these pretty prominent political figures where they were talking about how to borrow the Pale Horse Strategies playbook, the Tim Dunn and Ferris Wilkes playbook, and basically just apply the exact same thing in Colorado to prevent it, from, you know, to try to pull it back. Wow. Yeah. So, I mean, it is a national strategy. And Tim Dunn, who just sold his oil company and made, I think, another $2 billion off of it, he is now retired with more money than he would ever know what to do with and more time to use it. And he is already ramping up his uh, engagement in, you know, even further in the Trump campaign and other things. So it is a name that's even in Texas, surprisingly, there are f surprisingly few people who really know who he is. But I think in the wake of Paxton and the Fuentes scandal, there's been a growing awareness, more media coverage of him and his aims. So, One thing also that you mentioned was the Texas secessionist movement. And this is something that's been going in one form or another for a number of years, even to the point where parts of it were co-opted and brought to Moscow for an anti-globalization conference by a guy named Alexander Ayonov, who's now under indictment for shipping a bunch of money to a bunch of various groups who were doing similar things across the United States. And one thing I've just always wondered, because it seems like, you know, we fought a war over this question at one point, and it seems like it was pretty definitively settled that, no, you can't secede. This isn't something you can do. But it keeps coming up. So... Is this more of like a LARP to excite their base or is there really something to this? How serious are these people? Uh, you know, it's really difficult to tell because so I, I went to their the Texas secessionist movement in, in November or their uh, and or their first ever event, their first annual conference. Hmm. Now, it was probably 100 people tops there. A lot of them much older people. It was kind of like a, a meeting of of different kind of, you know, libertarians and then like people who think that the federal government is going to put a kill switch in your car. And then like some Tim Dunn aligned activists. There was a guy running a current a former Texas House member who spoke and also a current state senator who spoke, both of whom are financed by Dunn and Wilkes. But yeah, this movement, you know, they have kind of really over the last few years done a surprisingly good job of making this idea more palatable. Right. And again, I'm not try just trying, I mean, you know, I know social media is, is misleading, but like the number of, of, of the, the amount of social media presence they have is actually pretty surprising. And we've seen, you know, um, candidates for all sorts of positions in the state sign on to their Texit pledge, they call it Texit. Right. And you know, that is a uh, we saw in the legislature, I think, two, uh, last year, uh, a guy named Brian Slayton, who was uh, removed for having sex with a drunk 19 year old intern um, and who was financed by Dunn and Wilkes. He wanted there to be a referendum on Texas secession in the next general election. And then the Texas GOP has actually, um, you know, their delegates at their last convention also approved putting a referendum on this. So, like, this is an idea that, like, Yes, it is still very much on the fringe. And like the idea that this would get any serious traction without what can only imagine an insane blowback from the business wing of the Texas Republican Party and the you know business leaders here more broadly. It's still a very fringe idea. But again, like the way that we have seen fringe ideas move towards the mainstream in Texas tells me that it's not something that we should necessarily be, you know, laughing off. It is a I don't I don't want to say growing because I do not know how to quantify it, but it is something that, at least from my vantage point, is becoming more normalized than it ever has been. And again, this is a movement that, like, I think 30 years ago kind of fell off because one of their leaders held two people hostage. They've tried to kind of move away from, you know, this more like posse comitatus, like all that type right. of stuff. Uh, mentality and just, you know, be open about like, listen, this isn't working and it's time for us to text it. So. Right. Right. And you're right when you say that, like, these are ideas that are really just fringe and there's no way that a lot of people that have a lot of stroke in the state, like the business community would ever sign off on anything like this. But as you also said, these ideas have a way of moving from that's crazy. No way they do that. 
to a few years later, the serious people are starting to talk about it. And with the way things are going, it's definitely not something that you really want to see get any more oxygen on, you know, any kind of level, but yeah, here they are. And how do you see things going in November politically in Texas? I honestly don't know. You know, we, we, I think so on, on earlier this month, I briefly touched on this as you did you, like we saw a dark, dark, dark red wave here. You know, you mentioned the, the number of candidates who were backed by Don and Wilkes who won one of the more, I think, telling stats there. So in 2022, Dunn and Wilkes's uh, political groups via Defend Texas Liberty spent, I think, five-ish million dollars in the primaries on a slate of candidates. I think only one of them won. Right. So like 18 out of 19 of them lost. Um, most of them didn't even make it to runoffs, despite gobs of money behind them. And then this year, uh, 11 of 19, or I think, I, I can't remember the exact numbers, but like they saw a massive flip in not just the number of candidates who won, but there were some districts, like there was a, a woman named Shelly Luther who ran in 2022. She was she kind of built her platform off of going to jail because she wouldn't close her hair salon during, uh, during COVID, right? And her campaign kind of one of the things that kind of hobbled it is that she was at a rally and was lamenting the fact, or you know, lamenting the idea that kids aren't allowed to bully trans kids anymore and that they get punished for it, and was saying like you know basically that trans children make her uncomfortable. And even in 2022, there was a huge backlash against that. And she lost by, I think, seven points in her 2022 race. And she won by 17 earlier this year. Right. Of those races that Dunn and Wilkes as candidates won, like I think there were five or six that were rematches where they either narrowly won or like flipped by double digits the deficits that they had from even two years ago. And so kind of I bring that all up in the context of November because I think that there is a real potential that these dogs have caught the car. And I don't know, it, it is very difficult for me to kind of forecast how that would play out in the November general because Texas is, you know, a very difficult state to gauge. But like, I, I, I am wondering and people I've talked to are kind of wondering if like the, okay, this is the moment maybe where people are like, whoa. Like, this is what happens when our political system is decided by 3% of the, the electorate in primaries that are almost entirely decided by the hardest line voters. Right. We're seeing in Texas, there's more of a an effort by Democrats to kind of, you know, as in other states, capitalize on abortion, the border, LGBTQ issues. And they are running more candidates, I believe, this year. They're actually running candidates for, like, all of the Texas Supreme Court spots and other courts that are open. And those are statewide elections where, I, you know, it is not totally unforeseeable for them to potentially, you know, at least make those close. Um, but I do think that the it really – the the it, Texas has become – you know, for the longest time, there was a, a vibe in Texas politics about, like, we are Texas, you are national politics, and we do not want – Texas politics to, you know, we are, we are our own political system. Right. And we saw earlier this year or uh, earlier this month, like there were, there were primary count candidates who had been totally discounted as like not standing a chance. And then Trump got involved. And if you look at all the polling, like there were so many people who were like, oh, well, once Trump got involved, like I knew who exactly who I was going to vote for. I wanted to go vote. And so we are really seeing in Texas, I think, a, a really the, the DCifying, I guess, for lack of a better word, of our political system. And I think that that on a long enough trajectory, maybe combined with a Democratic candidate who is not Beto O'Rourke, who, ran, you know, has said he was going to confiscate, confiscate your ARs or, you know, somebody else who kind of is just not going to be palatable to these more right of center voters. I do think that on a long enough timeline, like there is a potential real, you know, real potential for some sort of electoral backlash to what we've seen in Texas over the last year or two. The question, though, becomes like, is it surmountable for Democrats in statewide elections in particular to kind of overcome all of the different things that work against them. So I don't know. That is my long way of saying I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, because you talk about the things that are working against them. And you know, obviously the fact that you have this establishment, this almost alternative media atmosphere where you have these guys funding it and they have so much control over the political machine in the state because they've elected so many of these candidates now that it's 
hard to overstate just how much of a structural hurdle that's going to be for the Democrats to win in certain places, because that's where you get to draw the maps. That's where you get to decide how many you know voting machines go to certain districts. And it really seems like, you know, you get optimistic about it because you see a candidate that resonates with a lot of people outside of Texas. Like you mentioned, Beto O'Rourke, a lot of people outside of Texas were really into that guy and thinking, yeah, this is going to be great. He's going to he's going to beat Ted Cruz. And then he gets stomped. He got his ass kicked. And you find yourself thinking like. Well, he got stopped because he's not appealing to people in Texas. He's appealing to people in you know Massachusetts and Washington. He's not necessarily somebody who is going to resonate. But it's hard to explain that to people that Texas is its own ecosystem and it has kind of its own rules outside of Texas. But that definitely seems to be the way the system works at this point. Yeah. And I would also add, you know, it's one of the big... There, every election cycle that I've been in Texas, there's always this the, you know wave of coverage. And people would be like, is this going to be the year that it, it goes at least purple? Yep. And what they seem to really misunderstand is how entrenched Republican support is in these rural communities. In order for a statewide to win, like, yeah, I can't remember the exact margins, but you would have to really, really perform well in rural communities in Texas. And again, this is a state with 254 counties. There are parts of Texas that are closer to Chicago, like Texarkana, which is on the border of Texas and Arkansas, right. is closer to Chicago than it is to El Paso. El Paso is closer to San Diego than it is to Houston. I say this all to say that, like, if you are a statewide candidate, it is really difficult to campaign in a state this big. And, you know, Beto tried it. And, you know, I think that he was never like, you know, that AR-15 comment, I think really, you know, he put on a silver platter the attack ads against them. Yeah. But what I do think is interesting is that one of the things we didn't really get into is that, you know, I touched I touched on this idea of school choice, which is the bulwark against it as a legislative item for the longest time has been a group of rural rural Republicans who basically make the case like, listen, our local school system is the lifeblood of our communities. No one is going to move to like the middle of West Texas to put a charter school there. You are just going to take money away from the thing that funds our salaries, our like like our our Friday night football, like all of this stuff. And what happened earlier this month is that Abbott also, you know, sank six million dollars that he got from Jeff Yass, one of the guys, uh, Pennsylvania guy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you know him. And they they really went again, like like went full bore against anti voucher incumbents and were really successful with that. And, you know, that's not, not something that necessarily is going to materialize in November. But like, I think there is a question like on a long enough timeline, are, are these rural Republicans who are kind of the bulwark against a Democratic statewide winning, are they going to get sick of like the fact that the legislature so often seems to be not only mirroring D.C., but be, but seems to be much more focused on like red meat social issues than they are like doing things that are helping their community. And at the same time, like they're maybe they're starting to see like, again, the the effects of this school choice stuff on their communities and i don't know i think that that you know it remains to be seen but again i don't think it's entirely implausible that like on a long enough timeline there is some backlash against a, a key line of electoral defense for republicans here so so what you're saying is there are wedge issues there's no unity between you know the rural republicans who as you said this is important to them it's way of life stuff it's culture it's friday night football versus the more urban republicans who really want to be able to starve the school systems to death and, you know, in some cases, hook up their friends who run charter schools. That's not a position that you can reconcile if you're trying to do it at a statewide level. These two things are, as you said, diametrically opposite. Right. And the other thing about this is that, like, school choice was one of the two big issues that animated the base and, you know, really, again, you know, has been the, the driving issue in Texas politics for the last year. But the, the other one is Ken Paxton. And if you look at his polling, like he pulled way lower than most other statewide officials in his last reelection, his poll numbers like the, I, I, I haven't looked at it in a minute, but they're not great. No. Like this man is currently like his legal troubles are not over in any way. We didn't get into this, but what started his impeachment proceedings was that he had fired some whistleblowers from his lawsuit who reported him to law enforcement. They filed a lawsuit saying that he had violated whistleblower laws and protections. 
Paxton settled with them for $3.2 million and brought it to the Texas legislature for them to fund it. And they were like, we're not going to fund you paying off people that you fired for reporting you. And then after the impeachment, Paxton, like that, that lawsuit was revived. And Paxton basically came out and said like, okay, well, I don't want to be deposed in this. So I do not dispute any of the facts of this case. So basically just saying like, yeah, all of the things that they got up on the stand during the impeachment <laughs> proceeding, excuse me of like, yeah, I'm not going to dispute that. And this is the man who like really has, you know, he's not the face of the Texas GOP, but like so much of the hill that they are dying on is in service of Ken Paxton's revenge for impeachment. And I think that, you know, that is not necessarily a viable political strategy for a broader electorate. I don't know. I, I think that it's a it's an interesting choice for that to be the hill that you're going to die on unless you are Tim Dunn or Ferris Wilkes or one of some of these other people. Right. And a lot of people like, for instance, the speaker of the Texas House, a guy by the name of Dade Phelan, and he was very outspoken about Paxton during the trial and they went after him really hard for it. He now has to do a runoff. Yeah. Because people like Dunn and Wilkes decided, nope, you went after this guy. And you got to think at some point, this guy's got support himself. He wouldn't be the Speaker of the House if he doesn't. He's got voters. He's got a fan base. At some point, when do those people say enough? Yeah, I mean, I think that's, you know, not only was Phelan uh, forced into a runoff, he actually got less less votes than than David Covey, who's the Dunn and Wilkes and Trump and Paxson backed candidate. And he would be, I think, the first person, the first speaker in like 50 years to lose reelection in his own district. But I think one of the things that will be really interesting uh, in that race in the runoff in May and, you know, that, that runoffs traditionally kind of can be a little, you know, fuzzy about who the turnout is because, you know, it's you're going out to vote for one person and one person only. So it's just a little bit different. But like voters in that district are are potentially going to lose one of the most powerful positions in the state representing this, you know, kind of, you know, Beaumont is by no means like a, like it is a kind of more industrial blue collar, like pretty very reliably red. But that whole area is like somewhere that like I think that there is a lot of long term feeling amongst residents there that they are overlooked in favor of like a Houston or other you know major urban centers. And they're potentially going to lose a house speaker who can use his job to like, like that it's a powerful job. And the idea that they may actually get rid of that in service of someone who is really kind of running on a, you impeached Ken Paxton and you work with Democrats. So you have to go like that is going to be a really interesting test you know, what voters are really prioritizing. So, right, right. Because it's like, here are your economic interests over here. Here are your, you know, social interests over here. And on this side, it's basically a revenge tour for this other guy over here. Is that something you're going to support? Is that something that you're going to come out and give your vote to? Are you prepared to sacrifice a whole lot of economic gain and benefit? For Ken Paxton. Yeah. And one of the other things that was fascinating about the Paxton kind of revenge tour is like, so he endorsed Bianca Gracia, who uh, was with the Oath Keepers and uh, she was with Stuart Rhodes and Enrique Tario on January 5th. Oh, great. <laughs> and, and Paxton endorsed her against a guy named Briscoe Kane, who is one of the most, by every measure, conservative members of the Texas legislature, but decided that he thought that he voted for the impeachment of Paxton and was and worked with the impeachment team on it. So he was persona non grata and he is like the ultimate villain of them. Um, they call they compared him to Judas. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> you also had Paxton do, uh, you know, there's this guy named Jared Woodfill, who is someone I've been writing about for six plus years. He's in Houston. And before I was doing this reporting in, in for the Texas Tribune, I was covering Southern Baptist sexual abuse. And Woodfill is was the longtime law partner of this guy named Paul Pressler, this SBC leader who has like been accused of abusing numerous boys. And Woodfill was literally, I wrote this story last March in a deposition was like, yeah, I knew that Pressler had been accused of child abuse, but I kept paying for young men to work out of his home because of business he brought into our firm. And like, that's on record. And like, it did not dissuade Ken Paxton whatsoever from endorsing him. Like there were so many, there were so many characters that Paxton endorsed in this race, you know, and, and a lot of them did get like clobbered, but like, even that I think is just, it is both telling 
about what the priority is. And also, I think, potentially has a risk of really isolating it's not necessarily that they like like these people are going to flip to Dems, but like the number of people I've talked to over the past few months who are just like I look around, and I'm like, what is this? What is this? The Texas GOP? Like what? Like this is so much of it has become unpalatable to so many people, and you just need some of those people to stay home. Yeah, and uh, you get a primary that's decided by the farthest right part of the base. And then a general election where all of a sudden you have a very hard line candidate going up against someone that like potentially can peel off moderate, more moderate votes. So, yeah. And you say you want to say to like, you know, the Democrats in that situation, just don't run anybody too crazy. Run somebody who is relatively sane, can not mention things about taking away your AR-15s, can say the right things at the right times. And you might just win this thing because They need, I mean, less so in Texas, but in a lot of places, they need all the votes they can get. And like we said earlier, this is a pattern that you're seeing, you know, across the country. This isn't just Texas. You're seeing this everywhere where the more extreme candidates are coming out of these primaries. And at least in 2022, a lot of them got clobbered in the general by Democrats because they didn't have the base of support to run somebody like that. So, yeah, I can kind of see what you're saying there. It's an interesting. It, this this next several month stretch in Texas, as well as everywhere else, is going to be very, very interesting to watch to see how all this plays out. So how do people support you in the work that you're doing on all of this? Because you're doing some amazing writing. You've You've done a ton of stuff on this particular subject, and it's just staggering the amount that you've been able to put out on this. How, how do people make sure that keeps going? Yeah, I mean, you can just follow me on Twitter at Robert, D-O-W-N-E-N underscore. You know, I we, we at Texas Tribune, we are nonprofit journalism, no paywall, nothing. We don't make anybody pay for anything. And so if you can financially support us, that'd be great. But if not, like sign up for our free newsletters. Like we have a, a kick-ass team that is constantly punching, you know, not above our weight, but we're a pretty small newsroom that I feel like is really just kicking ass all the time. And, you know, I am lucky in a sense that my job is writing about a a faction that doesn't seem to be um, either in, intentionally or unintentionally doesn't do <laughs> backgrounding. So there's just a lot of fertile ground to always be writing about who these newcomers are on the scene. But uh, as far as supporting my work, yeah, follow me on social media. And I think that everyone should be really, I'm biased, but I think that Texas is really the epicenter and a glimpse into what is happening nationally, particularly yeah. with the way that the far right is coalescing here. And so I think it is a, a worthy bellwether to be vigilant of. Definitely something you got to keep an eye on if you want to know what's going on. Robert, thank you so much for taking the time today. Appreciate it. You have a great rest of your day and we will talk again soon. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the did nothing wrong podcast. If you want to hear more, you can find us on the web at didnothingwrongpod.com. Please make sure you subscribe to get our content straight into your inbox. You can also follow us on Twitter at GrizzaBJJ, G-R-Z-A-B-J-J, as well as DNW Pod. We're extremely grateful for paid subscriptions and donations that allow us to keep doing this important work. Thanks, and remember, everyone mentioned did nothing wrong.